episode of The Dealer Playbook, a podcast that explores what it takes to create a thriving career right here in the retail auto industry. I'm your host, Michael Cirillo. Today, I'm speaking to my pal, Marco Mantenuto. He is a brand specialist at Audi Queensway. We're talking about how to absolutely crush it in your career in car sales. I'm super excited about this. You know, your name has come up frequently amongst the the DPV community uh, for those that they look up to, those that are setting a good example. Obviously, I've been super impressed as I've been following you on LinkedIn and and seeing the variety of posts and content that you're putting out there, the thought provoking uh, subject matter. So there's a lot that I want to talk to you about. But first, I guess I, I just want to turn it over to you, Marco. Like what what's your journey been so far in the business? How'd you get into the business? Uh, I got into the business uh, because of the love of cars. I loved cars since I was a kid. And uh, in the end, I wanted to, um, you know, I remember reading a quote that's pretty cliche that says, if you do what you love for a living, then you're not really working. And boy, were they wrong. I'm still working. <laughs> but I love what I do. So I, I love the fact that I, uh, I was able to combine um, my, you know, my likeness to talk to people with my passion for cars yeah, and uh, really that's, that's what happened and it came together really well. And uh, without uh, always, uh, you know, without some struggles, so there's always big, big struggles at the beginning. I got into the industry um, back in 07, 08. Um, I started with Chrysler while they were asking for a bailout. I was knocking on their door for a job. So that was a bit struggling. And uh, the lack of training that I received was, enormous so I would and I would to the point where I would go to my managers at the time and beg them to train me and and please train me please train me and they wouldn't do it so I had to uh, claw my way um, through the ranks and and learn it my way by sacrificing a few years of selling if I had proper training at the beginning I probably uh, wouldn't have had to invest so much time banging my head against the concrete yeah um, but at the same time what that did for me is that i you know i learned by making the mistakes and that means that i will never make them again and at the same time whenever somebody new comes into the store uh when i was a manager as an example whenever i would hire somebody i would always train those people to make a point out of it you, you know even right now as a sales guy when we hire somebody new i'll go up to them and I'll explain to them about the cars and how they're built and the science behind them and all that so um it, it really made put into perspective that i wanted to give pass it forward after. Right. So, yeah. And it's interesting you bring that up because certainly one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, um, that shines through, especially when you do your videos and stuff on LinkedIn. Um, I caught a video of yours where it was month end. I think this was just recently, actually it's month end and you're in an elevator and you're bringing pizza to your detailers. Uh, and so what you just said, I find really interesting about finding your way and acknowledging that maybe perhaps your way was the harder route. Like had you just been trained and onboarded properly and expectations set and maybe some better um, stewardship interviews, as I call them, the one-on-ones, regular check-ins. Do you think, because you had just mentioned that you'd, you've you learned lessons and gained experience from the way you were brought up in the business. Does that in any way contribute now to what I'm seeing is somebody that buys into culture, like how you deal with your coworkers. Um, I think that's, that doesn't stem from that as much. Um, I, I mean, helping out my coworkers that are just been hired. That's what came out of that. The, the buying the pizza and, and, and really anybody that gets, that gets paid hourly, uh, that crosses my path will always get, um, a little bit of a special treatment for me because I still remember what it was like working, you know, hourly and, uh, and really having to watch the clock and couldn't wait to go to go home. And really there is the ladder is, is not as clear at that point where right now it's like, okay, if I want to be a manager, this is the steps I got to take where when you're working hourly, it almost feels like you're, um, you're, you don't have a clear path in front of you. A lot of the times so that's, that's how I felt when I was working uh, right. hourly. So I, I love to take care of those people because ultimately they're, you know, they're the backbone of, of any organization because without them, it's, it would be hard for us to do, um, to do, to accomplish what we accomplish without my detailers. I wouldn't be able to deliver, you know, 30, 40 cars a month, uh, without my receptionist, I wouldn't be able to, um, get a, get my clients to get a hold of me as easy or help me with my licensing or anything really that's, uh, that's time consuming for me, uh, that takes away from concentrating on selling, uh, you know, they take care of a lot of that load off me. Uh, down to my licensing ladies. So my licensing ladies all have my cell phone number. They call me directly on my cell phone number if somebody has tickets or fines. 
that takes away one step. So usually they would have to call the receptionist. The receptionist calls me. I like, that's a waste of time for me. So I give them my cell phone number. They get Starbucks on the regular. I have all their orders on my phone. I know exactly what they like. And every now and then I'll show up at Starbucks and, and take care of them because it's, it's important to bring a smile to, um, uh, to everybody that's helping you because they're, you know, more willing to, to ultimately help you. And if you, the more help you get, the more, the easier is to, is to succeed in any position, I believe. Right. So. Yeah. And well, and you're certainly proving that. And I think that's, that's one of the things that I'm fascinated by, right? You, you're very vocal about the things that need to change in the industry, right? About the complacency of the industry. Um, and so I love that you're not just another one of these dudes out there that's, that's saying what the problem is you're actually demonstrating the solution. And so I want to, I want to just give you a huge props for that because that is something Thank that, you. that I think needs to happen more. I mean, gosh, I think that's one of the reasons why your approach resonates with me. It's because that's kind of the same thing that powers why I do any of this stuff. Like instead of just talking about it, which we get a lot of on social media, just the, you know what my problem is with this and I got a problem with that, blah, 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 and, but they never like actually offer a solution, you're actually going that step ahead. And I urge those listening to this podcast, you got to connect with, with Marco. We're going to shout out his social profiles and everything at the end of the episode. So make sure you stay tuned for that, but you're going to see just a very simple and effective way by which you can demonstrate the solution, not just talk about, talk about the problems. Um, so the, this culture piece, I want to, I want to just go back to something that you said going out of your way to put a smile on somebody else's face. This, um, this to me is so powerful because traditionally in business, I think you have a profit center in one silo, the people that quote unquote generate the revenue. And then you have your cost centers, those that are an expense. And I've just never, ah, you know, maybe this is why I'm bald, man. Like this is, I, I scratched my head <laughs> over this one because you just highlighted a very simple way in which the, the quote unquote cost center is actually as much a part of revenue generation as the person who's speaking one-to-one -one with, with customers, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you, you just gave full props. Like I wouldn't be able to sell 30, 40 cars a month if it wasn't for all these people doing their part. Is that something that you always saw? Were you always very like leader oriented or entrepreneurial in that sense? Or is that something that's happened organically since you've entered the car business? Um, I think it started with my dad. I got to give him that, that credit for that because uh, my dad always told me, he's like, you got to, you got to take care of people. My dad's managed, you know, hundreds of people in his lifetime, probably closer to a thousands now. And uh, one thing that he's always expressed to me is like, you know, like it doesn't cost anything to buy somebody a coffee. He's like when I, when he takes his trademen out to do a service call, he's in the marble and granite business, he'll buy them a coffee, he'll buy them lunch. And, and it's, it's important to do the small things, the devil's in the details. And really, you know, I, I would see it as a kid growing up and going to work with them sometimes that I would see the, the reaction people had to that, the positive reaction and the extra steps they would take you know, instead of looking at something that was wrong uh, with, with the job site, they would go back and fix it mm -hmm. because they cared about my dad because they knew that my dad was there for them. So they had to be there for him. Uh, it was, a, it's kind of an unspoken agreement. It's like, okay, listen, like you do, you do a lot for me. So I'm going to reward you every step of the way, every chance that I get, I'm going to reward you. My dad's always been the guy that fought for the raises and, uh, um, and always again, bought small gifts and things for, for his employees to the point where we've been invited to weddings and, uh, birthday parties of, uh, the kids of the, of the people that there were, you know, for, for lack of better terms under my dad in positions. Right. Yeah. And, uh, th that resonated with me. I wanted to build the, the same environment everywhere I went. It didn't matter where there was with my detailers, my receptionist, everywhere I went, I've always wanted to, to bring that positiveness to, to other people. And again, that goes as well with, you know, leave a place better than, than you found it sort of deal. Right. And, and, and same thing, same approach with people, same approach I take with, uh, with when I go and wash my car downstairs in the wash bay, I will squeegee, um, the, the wash bay. It's just, it, if you get into the mentality of putting other people first, sometimes it, it does pay out. And 
um, you know, putting yourself first sometimes is more detrimental than putting somebody else first. That's the way I look at it. Right. So it's, yeah. uh, and in the car business, unfortunately in the car industry, uh, there is a, I hate using the word greed because it's not really greed. It's a, it's a bit more selfishness. Nobody's out there to, to take advantage of you, but a lot of people are out there for themselves. And that's what I, uh, what I never really liked from the beginning. And that's just not with the car industry. It's with everywhere you go. So as long yeah. as you can be the change, like, Hey man, like it doesn't cost anything. And it, uh, it, it does help you ultimately down the road. So yeah. even though you might not see the result immediately, uh, down the road, you know, when you need it, you, you're going to see the results, right? When you need it the most. I love it. It, it kind of shines a spotlight on what I think one of the issues is in context to what you just said is that I think a lot of people get into the industry, mm-hmm. uh, I guess, ownership layer. They get into it because they're like, oh, this seems like a really good viable investment. I'm going to get into the car business. And what do I need to do that? Well, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get the license. I'm going to get the building. I'm financing in place. Mm-hmm. I'm a dealer now. Oh, crap. Now we need 80 people. So let's, let's get those. We need the lifts. We need the tools. We need the, the software. We need the web. So they, they assemble all of these things that on paper equate to a thriving business. Mm-hmm. But then I think to your point, what we re, what, what's realized is, oh, crap, this is a people business. This is not an on paper business. We're not playing a video game here. These are real people. I have a stewardship. I use that word very carefully, methodically, because we use leader. But what is a leader if not a steward? Someone who has been, um, someone who has been blessed with an opportunity to help shape and lift others, and and so that gets completely passed by because it was like, well, on paper though, Mar- Marco's Marco's our best guy. He's selling thirty to forty cars a month. That's all that matters. Uh, but Susie, she's you know Susie or or Davy, he's he's a detailer and he's at twenty two dollars an hour, and that seems too expensive for a detailer. And they don't Where seem productive cut? because or or so and so doesn't seem very productive. Maybe they're too. You know what? They're lazy. They can only sell eight cars a month. They're lazy. And it's like, no, wait. We, these are very real people with very real brains, with very real struggles and different upbringings and different experience. And, and you've assembled all of these people because on paper, it was one of the quote unquote assets you needed to invest in a dealership, but then things get real. And so I love that you are, are doing two things that, that really stand out to me. The first one is you are not pawning off your duty and obligation to help lift others to the leadership layer. Man, our culture sucks. I, you know, if our leaders need to be the blah, blah, blah. And you go on Facebook and there's the next guru saying, leadership starts at the top and leaders have to, you're showing very real that I, I don't need to be over here or in that role or in this. I can do, I can lift those around me. I can actually, a frontline guy can actually, be the reason why others want to come and work here. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I love. And I know I'm like talking a lot here because, but it it just impresses me. And I want to, I want to bring specific call outs to you because I think it's tremendous. And I want those listening to really think carefully, listen carefully. What are we talking about here? What ideas are inspiring you as you listen to Marco speak? Take those ideas, write them down, implement them, do something with them. You've just heard something as simple as a cup of coffee to express genuine appreciation for those that help lift and support you. You don't know, man. Like you don't know what that individual is dealing with. That cup of coffee, that smile, the pizza. What is it? We're talking about 40 bucks once a month to grab pizza for the guy, like for the crew. Like, come on, it's nothing. Uh, And the impact that that can have on others. And then the second thing you brought up was, putting others first, this kind of the great debate between greed and selfishness versus selflessness. It's interesting to me, you know, today's society that gets at least perpetuated through the media to us is that every man for himself. No, I'm in this alone, man. I compete against my other sales pros that are on the floor with me. I compete against everybody else. I'm trying to climb the ladder like everyone else. I'm not going to put myself for, or I'm not going to put others first because every time I do that, I get trampled upon. The difference I see in someone like you is that you actually have a strategy for growth. 
And I think that's the way, that's the way to make sure you don't get taken advantage of when you give of yourself to not just be the pin cushion, but to actually be like, well, no, I'm doing it this way because I'm in control. So, yep. um, so, I mean, kudos to you, man. Like, I think, I think that's tremendous. So let's, let's talk about, um, something that else that you've touched on. So when we just talk about the issues, we just perpetuate the negativity in the industry, but you're actually demonstrating that things can be different. One of the things that you are doing very consistently is videos on LinkedIn, right? This to me is a representation of how simple evolution can be or how simple disruption can be. And I know disruption is something that that is on your mind. So speak to me a little bit about that. How did you, were you always comfortable on video or was that something that you just kind of had to push yourself to do? Oh God, no. I think I opened up my first YouTube account about 11 years ago and I didn't post anything until last year. So it took, it took about 10 years before I, uh, I pulled the trigger and started recording myself. Um, it's, it's definitely, you definitely need to step out of your comfort zone. And it's something I, I say that now and I, and it kind of feels silly that I was just, there was so much pressure that I put on myself about video because now I can just take out my phone and in the moment, if I'm, if I think that it's something that it's either going to benefit somebody or somebody's going to find it funny or whatever the case might be, I will pull out my phone and just record it and share it. And that's the beauty about today's society. It's uh, you don't have to tell a story. You can let the story tell itself. Um, by recording it and just putting it out there. Mm. And ultimately that's, that's really what it came down to. And, you know, in our, our industry, it's, um, you know, we're, we're stuck a little bit, a few steps behind everybody else and everything else. And when you see people literally just making an income using their phone and recording themselves doing something, uh, whether it's, you know, baking or, uh, uh that the key, one of the biggest earners earners on YouTube is a, is a child who unpacks toys and plays with them on a camera. Like, <laughs> right. like where was that when I was a kid? Right. Like, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's not, it, and again, it's not about, uh, these people are taking video to the next level and made an income out of them. And this is how they put food on their table and, and live a very generous, generous lifestyle for some of the cases. Uh, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to, you know, bring some light into the guy that got hired at the Hyundai store in the middle of nowhere that hasn't been trained. And they said to him, you know, you're going to make a hundred thousand dollars a year when you come and sell cars. And, and then he gets a desk and a phone and a computer and, and, and no training. So <laughs> that's more what I'm, I do this for. <laughs> Cause I was that guy. I, to learn, to learn my ways, I had to sit by the, the top sales guy and listen in to him talking to customers and then making my own script. And, but yeah, like this is, this is why I put the material out there. It's like, take it, take it and, and go because, um, it's, it's free and it's, it takes me no time to do it and it's there. Right. So, uh, disrupting the industry, the industry is again, it's a little bit dated. Um, it could use help, uh, from within the manufacturers talk to the dealerships, like they're young rebellious teenagers. <laughs> and the teenagers talk to the, the dealerships, the, the teenagers talk to the manufacturers like they're the overbearing parents that think they know best, but really they're trying to homeschool their kids without a clue in their minds. Uh, so there's that, that disconnect. And then there is the disconnect within the dealership of the uh, service department and the sales department and the parts department and who makes what and who does that and whose fault is that. And, and so it's, you, you put it very eloquently by saying silos, they're, they're walls that need to be knocked down. Uh, and, uh, communication needs to be better all around, whether it's uh, within the dealership or with the manufacturers. Like, uh, I always joke around and say, maybe the manufacturers should send their people to work at the dealerships for a week, a month, a year, whatever it is, just let them, let them see what the front line is and vice versa, you know, send, send the sales get to a, a manufacturing plant and let them sit through a four and a half hour meeting on what colors they should pick for the, the market. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, and I think that would, um, it would create a lot of the, make the disconnect go away a lot of it, but you know, again, it's, well, and I think one of the issues too is with the amount of data that we have today, it's shocking to me that, um, Audi, uh, Queensway would be compared to another Audi store that's in a market that's completely different with different yep. economic drivers and different, yet you all show up on the same report and, you know, the top five on that list get all, hey, congratulations. It's like, well, but they were all in a highly populated 
urban, yeah, high income earning, you know, whatever. And we are in a market where Kia and or, you know, whatever it might be, Kia is the, the main brand. Why am I even showing up on this same list? Yeah. Nice. So, so huge disconnects right from the top down to the middle and right down to where the rubber meets the road. So from your perspective, what is something that a dealer can do, even if it's just a small step? You, you talk about the silos. What's maybe just one thing from your vantage point that dealers could do to start breaking down the silos between departments? Um, oof, that's a loaded question. It's a tall order. I know, that's um, why I said like, just <laughs> even if it's really small. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the best general manager I ever worked for was, uh, before he became a general manager of a dealership, he was a service manager huh. and, uh, yeah, he was by far hands down the best general manager I ever got to work with. And he was, a. Uh, and I was shocked to find out maybe three months after I started working at the dealership that he was a service manager. Um, but I think that's where the main disconnect is. It's the fact that, um, salespeople will, you know, climb the ladder and become general manager and put the sales department as a priority right. and service managers are, you know, oftentimes they're either, uh, I've seen a few mechanics that made it to that position. And I've seen uh, a lot of them were advisors that climbed the steps up and, and got into that position and they're all prioritizing their own departments because that's all they know. They don't know well, sales work and their service doesn't know, uh, sales doesn't know how service works, right? So uh, when you're a general manager, you, you, part of the position is that you got to know how everything functions, right? You got to be able to manage parts, um, service and sales, uh, without prioritizing really any of them, but you have so much on your plate at that point that it's, it's really tough to fill that position because you also have to deal with the city. If you want to put up right. a sign on the front lawn, you got to deal with corporate head office, uh, and you got all this, uh, you know, who's going to pile the snow and who's going to cut the grass and who's going to clean the toilets. And it's just like, there's so much that you hire people, you put like sales managers, sales managers, and you put them into place in order to mitigate and help you and not let that lid blow off. Um, but at the same time, the people that you're hiring a lot of the times, again, they're, they only know that department. Like, uh, you're not going to get a, a sales guy to be the service manager. It's illogical. Um, right. but it'd be, it'd be nice to kind of get maybe again, like get a salesperson to work the service drive through every now and then. Like I've, I've done that. I've worked the service drive through. I've dealt with really angry customers. You want to see an angry customer, you go spend a day in service. You, you're going to, you're bound to at least hit one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so totally. somebody without a warranty, somebody that bought a car privately, somebody, you know, God only knows what, and, and really get a feel for what these people have to go through mentally, the strain that they have to deal with between dealing with mechanics, getting phone calls and service appointments and all that. Um, and then get, maybe get a service guy to, uh, to, to go into a sales role and, and put them under pressure of negotiating a deal. So, yeah. uh, well, you know, it, it, it brings up a really good point, which is how well do you actually know what your coworkers do? Mm -hmm. uh, in my organization, you know, in the past full transparency, we've had times where somebody will be on the team and they'll be like, I honestly have no clue what so-and-so does. <laughs> and my yeah. response as the leader is go and talk to them. Yeah. I, I need to encourage them to go and understand. And, and the more that those conversations happen where, where they are now exposed to the miscellany of things that that other role has to do that they have no clue about. Wow. Do they become much more compassionate and less judgy and more, you know, it becomes very real for them that they actually need to keep in constant communication with that other individual instead of just sitting here. It's a weird character trait of mankind, isn't it? Where, or humankind, whatever, I don't know what we say now, people kind, humankind. This is not me trying to be insensitive to any groups. This is, I actually don't know anymore. It's, it goes too fast. I'm starting to feel Everybody. like my parents. I think we all turn into our parents and I'm like, I have no, I can't keep up with it all. Anyways, but it's a weird character trait of, of us as a human race where we just automatically assume the worst in somebody. Like, let so me tell, let me, let me stop you right there. You know yeah. what? That's happening yeah. in the time when the world has been the most connected. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Isn't it weird? It seems so weird to me. Um, like, you're right. We are the most connected we've ever been. There are, not figuratively, literally 
at least a hundred ways that someone could get in touch with me. The fact that they choose not to is bizarre. Yeah. And it is also bizarre to me that amidst all of those effective ways to get a hold of me, the, the best is still to look me in the eyes and or pick up the phone and actually talk to me. <laughs> I love I love calling people for that reason. I uh, uh, my friends know that they they know that I don't text them. I'll only text clients uh, if I have to. But picking up the phone and making that conversation, uh, that t- half hour text message back and forward to a, a five minute conversation where you can feel the emotions yeah. rather than uh, you know the guy just dropped my bagel in the drive through and now I'm pissed off and who's this Mark reaching out to me? What's, <laughs> what the hell does he want now, right? <laughs> Uh, another good example is, uh, how excited were you as a kid when somebody knocked on the door? <laughs> right. Versus everybody now. would get to the, everybody would go to the stairs and look, who is it? Yeah. Versus now. So yeah, it's, uh, you, you, it is, it's, it's kind of sad, but at the same time, it's, it's not too late. We, we could, this is not something that we're far gone and we can't stop. It's again, like my detailer, uh, manager knows. He says to me, when you have an issue, email me. I say, Al, I can't do that. I need to talk to you. I either like it, it that's why I walk 15,000 steps a day is because we have a three floor building and, and a mm-hmm. ton of stairs, but I will come to you and talk to you. And so the, you, we can solve this in, in a, in a polite manner and, and not me sending you an email. This is what wasn't clean on the car or this is the damage we found. No, that doesn't sound good. It's like, listen, Al, like you guys have done a great job. You do 35 cars a month. You're bound to drop the ball sometimes. Um, this is what I found wrong with the car. Not a big deal. Client is happy. We're just going to bring her back and, and do a detail on the car again. And everybody just kind of is like, okay, let's keep going. Let's not get stressed out over this. We dropped the ball once, but we can definitely, uh, you know, improve from here. So yeah. it's, yeah, it, it's, you're right though. It is, uh, uh, it depends on, on, on the mentality of the people that you're, that you're managing at a certain level and, and the openness. If you tell somebody, you know what, like, here's your position. This is what you do. This is, this is what your, um, your real role makes the, you know, it requires of you to do. But at the same time, if you have any questions, that person does this, that person does this, this person does that. You need to, you know, get up and talk to them and that's it. Yeah. Right. I love what you just so. said. It's, it's something I want to touch on briefly before I, I segue into the next thing that I want been dying to talk to you about. So you said, I need to come to you so that we can deal with this politely. Mm-hmm. And you also touched on, we know, we, hey, we're going to fail at times, but let, let's just, let's just take it easy for a minute. Like, yeah. yeah okay. We're going to, this leads me to what I want to just say before we talk, jump into the next topic, because the next topic is going to lead to a whole lot of failing forward. Um, <laughs> but, but it is that, you know, just working with each other, I, we have this weird thing. It is so bizarre to me that we have this weird thing whereby we expect everybody to be perfect. Yet tonight you go to the, you go to dinner with somebody and you get into a conversation. And the first thing somebody says about like some mishap is, ah, well, you know, nobody's perfect or I'm not, but I'll never be perfect. So you can't expect them to be perfect. But when it comes to business, man, do we have these expectations of perfection rather than failing forward? I think, I think, you know, for myself, speaking for myself, I learn so much faster when I fail. I have a love hate relationship with failure because I hate the way it feels in the moment it's happening. But boy, do I love the the result, the conclusion, the ideas, the, the the strength, the learning, the wisdom that comes as a result. And so it's this love hate relationship. Um, but I love what you said: dealing dealing or working through something politely, understanding that because none of us are perfect. Um we can only aim for progress and day by day progress. You know, I say this to, to people that I, that I do consulting with or coaching with where they get overwhelmed because they don't feel like they're stacking up to, you know, I imagine a lot of people can relate to everything that you've talked about this, this hard knocks way of getting into the business. Um, and I think, you know, you serve as a, as a kind of a messenger of hope, like, Oh man, he did it. I feel like, I can do it now too, which sounds like is ultimately your mission, but understanding that there's a lot of failure and there was a lot of small steps in there. Like don't discredit the small steps, small steps compounded are what amounts to the Marco you are listening to today. Um, And so taking those small steps forward. Now, having said that, 
2020 has been one heck of a massive step. Um, and people are still looking to navigate uncertainty. There is still, there was lingering uncertainty pre pandemic in the form of big disruptive players that, that you've brought up here, like Uber, Airbnb, Netflix. We talk a lot about Carvana and their model. There's two sides to that coin. There's those that say, yeah, it sounds all great on paper, but they haven't made any money yet. And right, 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 right. And then there's those that think that, you know, a magical stork drops a coin off on your doorstep that you can go buy a car from a vending machine. So let's talk about disruption. Let's talk about some of the things that you're seeing um, from your vantage point. Obviously, you are in a position where some people have the opinion that you're not going to exist in five years because of all this no. disruption. There's others that say, no, there's going to be car sales professionals in the year 8,000. Like we're, you know, so what's your vantage point? Where are you coming from on this? And, and I guess the loaded part of this question is what can I do today to step into this in a much more prepared way? Huh? So my vantage point is this, the, ever since I got in the business and probably 10 years before that, people have been saying the salespeople are going to be a thing of the past. And yet here we are having a conversation about sales. Um, so I don't, I don't think that you necessarily can make this position disappear. And if we could, Carvana would already have 90% of the business, which they don't, they actually have the smallest, the smallest part. Right. And the reason being it's because, you know, I, I work, you know, most days, 10, 12 hours a day. And, and I work really hard for my money and what I make. And, uh, I, when I go into a place to spend my money, like, uh, I'll make a good example is I just, uh, I, I bought a gift of a, um, it's called a pizza peeler. I had no idea what, uh, how intricate it was, but it's something that you, that you used to take the pizza in and out of the oven. Family member got a, a pizza oh, oven. Okay, there okay. you go. Yeah, yeah. They were struggling with it. I recognized that the wood one wasn't working. I go into the uh, Adamson's uh, barbecue, I think it was, or one of the, the barbecue places that also sells ovens, and I talked to a salesperson because they had no idea. I don't know. I don't want to go online and watch 15 <laughs> YouTube tutorials for two hours. Hey, I don't guys, have uh, the this time. This is how I use my pizza peeler. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I don't yeah. have the time or, or the, or the energy to, to go through that, even though I watch my YouTube videos at a, at a higher speed. Yeah. Um, but I, I wanted to go inside and talk to a human being and have me explain that this one has grooves on it and it's got holes. So the flour comes out of the bottom and the grooves let the pizza slide into the oven yeah. easier. And like he gave me all the pros and cons and the length of the, 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 the handle and how long it should be. And I, and I love that. I'd look for people like that when I go in, I want to be sold when I walk somewhere and I go and spend my money. Right. Not so much because uh, I need a reason to spend my money. Chances are there, I'm 50% of the decision there. I'm already sold on the product. Otherwise I wouldn't have walked into your store. Right. Uh, I found the need for in my life that I, I need it. And basically all you have to do is give me the pros and cons, the benefits on, on the spot and whether or not I should reach for my wallet at that point. Yeah. So, so you're you like know, me, a complete and total lay down. I was huge lay down, massive. <laughs> I've, I've already done most of the work. You just got to yeah. be nice to me and give me the pros and cons. <laughs> That's it. Like for me to walk away without spending money, you like, you must've been horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> like you must've, you must've disappeared for an hour. Right. It's half an hour. I'll still wait for you going, where did you go? <laughs> I still want to buy this, <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a total lay down. And most people are nowadays. Cause, uh, you know, I, I'm not the one that has the time, but most people have, like, I have a good client of mine that actually reached out to me on LinkedIn and, uh, uh, I just bought a car for me on Saturday and he, he was watched all the videos. He, he texts me constantly. Um, not in an annoying way by any means, but like in a happy, like excited, like yeah, I just right. bought this car. Like, what do you think of this body kit? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? Uh, do you know anybody that does this, this and that? Like, I want to modify it. I want to make the car mine. And, and you know, that's why that's what we're, we're really there for. If cars were boring and you know, like you don't need a salesperson to sell you a Metro pass, uh, or, you know, anything or, a, right. a one of those, those cards, like it's just, but you do need a salesperson to sell you a complicated machine. Now, when it comes to Audi, for example, nobody needs an Audi. People want an Audi. So 
you get into the customization level of these cars and what kind of trim you're going to put in the interior. Are you going to go carbon fiber mirror covers? Are you going to go 19, 20, 21, 22 inch wheels? Um, how, how do you want to personalize this purchase that, that is yours? Not to say that Honda, Toyota, Nissan, and Volkswagen don't have that. They, they still have that because people have a, a special connection with the car and they want to make it theirs, like right. their homes. Yep. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, I, I've read online that it's got a two liter turbo, but I want to go on a test drive and see how that feels. So I, I think that, uh, you know, one, one of the things that I, that I believe should happen or could happen or is in the cards is test drive centers. For example, mm. if people don't want to, a lot of people that I find, you know, in the working in the industry for this long is the fact that people don't want to necessarily talk to a salesperson when they're early on in the process, they want to, test drive, you know, they've might have narrowed it down online to three vehicles and all they want to do is come in and test drive it, test drive each one of the cars and you find roadblocks. And that's where you find the dealerships is, uh, you know, like you come in, like if you were to come into my dealership tomorrow and say, I want to drive an RS3 uh, and that said, that's all you want to do. I'm like, okay, I'll grab you the keys to an RS3. We're going to go outside and we're going to drive an RS3 because that's what you asked me for. Um, but a lot of, a lot of salespeople, unfortunately, they put roadblocks like, Oh, well, why do you want to buy an RS3? Why do you want to drive it? They don't understand that, that person Let me has spent ask you some 15, qualifying 20 questions. hours researching it. Yeah, they, totally. it qualifying questions, right? Yeah. So if, if just same thing online, if they send you a lead and they say, I need the answers to these questions, answer the questions and then go into asking a question back. Right. This um, is why I don't, I don't know if I'd be a good car sales professional. Cause I think my qualifying question would go something like this. I'd be like, Hey, thanks so much for coming to Audi Queensway. My name's Michael. Um, do you mind if I just ask you one question? Do you want me to get out of your way and leave you alone until you summon me? Yes. Okay. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be right over here. <laughs> like, it's, uh, it's funny cause nowadays you don't find that, that much of it either anyways. Right. Like you don't find people that come in and, and are hostile against salespeople. Right. Uh, the, you know, the, the industry shifted so much where you know, before people didn't want to give you their phone number because they were afraid to call you. Now they're willing to give you the phone number and they hope that you call them. Right. <laughs> and a lot of salespeople are not, right? Uh, but yeah, like test drive centers, I think would be a, a great idea. I don't know if I'm, if I'm kind of cutting my job in half right now or, uh, you know, hitting, hitting myself with the shovel here. But No, you know, I don't you, think you know, so. I, but, you know, as you're saying that though, I think we need to be open on the back end of this industry in, in that, Today, you are a brand specialist. Tomorrow, you may have to be a test drive specialist. Like, we're mm -hmm. so close to this idea that, oh, well, no, he, he was a car, car sales professional. He can't exist anymore because we got rid of car sales professionals. What are you talking about? Evolve, grow, shift, yep. adapt. Don't be so caught up on, yeah, but if I was a car sales pro, my trajectory would have been... Um, used car manager and then it would have been new car manager and then it would have been general sales manager. It's like, dude, throw all that crap out the window. We're all trying to figure this out. Have you ever lived in 2020 and beyond me either? So like, <laughs> you know, let's, we're, we're all going to figure this out. And what an incredible opportunity for all of us to, to say, Hey, we actually have some input based on actions, behavior, mindset, um, talents, abilities, desire to learn, willingness to learn and take action. We have the ability to shape what our future looks like to a de greater degree than any of our predecessors ever did, barring, you know, those that were the first employees in dealerships when they first existed. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's tremendous. Exactly. Test drive centers. And also, you know, to, to that point, that kind of feeds into something that I've been thinking about, which is that dealerships might take a smaller footprint on the uh, new sales side and a larger footprint in fixed uh, and maybe, you know, used cars, but you'll see larger like service centers appearing because the showroom may, you know, uh, turn into having one or two of each model or each trim in like one color. And you'll just have like iPads or some sort of device to be like, Hey, Hey, you heard it here first, by the way, if this becomes a thing for crying out loud, <laughs> like, you know, you, you, you know how they can like hologram in dead singers and stuff. And it looks like they're standing yeah. on stage. Like, why couldn't we do that with projectors where it's like, well, I want to see this vehicle in, in blue. 
you change the channel and that thing, the projectors like paint that thing blue right in front of you. They paint it red, they paint it whatever. And then you, Funny you say that because we have that at Audi without the projectors. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> we have uh, uh, Oculus. The uh, Okay, yeah. The, yeah, exactly. That's probably even a cheaper solution to 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 this whole thing. Just seeing it in a different, like, so, so we're cutting out some of the, the stuff that doesn't need to happen anymore because to your point, Customers are much more qualified. They're doing research. They're watching videos. They're getting they're they're getting that emotional like, oh man, this will look great in my driveway, and I'll feel awesome driving this thing. That the the next step is they just need to walk through those doors and make the deal happen. Now, are you a proponent also in the in the vein of disruption of like speeding up the sales process, the financing process, the getting them in and out as quickly as you can, or how do you navigate that? I, uh, so I give people timelines. So it's funny because when I was a manager, I had a client call me and complain that they were in my showroom for 20 minutes and nobody approached them. 20 minutes. I was, it was on a Saturday, 20 minutes. I was in your showroom. Nobody approached me. And I said, man, like that's a long time. Are my sales guys sleeping? So I went back on the cameras and I watched and the client was in her showroom for a minute and 36 seconds. (laughs) That, but that felt like 20 minutes to them. That was, and you know what? I don't blame them because I walk in somewhere. I walk into a restaurant. If I'm not greeted right away, if something happens, like uh, it, it feels like a lifetime. So the main idea is this, like speeding up the process. Uh, I don't think we need to speed it up as much as we need to set realistic expectations. So what I tell my clients is this, guys, we're going to take the deposit. And then after this, you're going to go and see my finance manager within 25 to 35 minutes, you will be out and on your way. So do we still have enough time for this? Yes, no, maybe. And we go forward from there. Guys, I'm going to bring the car downstairs for you to test drive. This is going to take three to four minutes for me to do. Wait for me by the front door. It's like set their expectations properly because that's all, you know, it's like somebody coming into your house for the first time or you going to a friend's house and really having to pee but not knowing where the washrooms are. Mm-hmm. And that feels like a lifetime. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, do I tell them, do I ask them? Like, is this the right time to ask them if I can use their washrooms? Well, well and you're bringing up password? something that's important in setting expectations, which also means that you need to be focused on what you're doing. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in a dealership and like that poor sales manager, that poor sales rep is getting pulled in 14 directions while they're trying to do something. If I say it's four minutes, that means that means if you're listening and you're like, yeah, this sounds great. Well, guess what? That means that you actually have to deliver on the four minutes. If it's not going to be four minutes, tell them the actual time. If you know that you're scatterbrained and you're going to walk to that office and then you're going to allow someone to sideswipe you and now you found yourself looking for a key in your office when you were supposed to be going there and back, that's on you. But you got to make sure that that can't happen. You got to set real expectations. Yeah. Love it, man. And it's funny. It's funny because uh, when you tell somebody four minutes, if you are six minutes, uh, it's still acceptable. You know, not to say that you got to take advantage of people's time, but um, just telling them that it's going to take this many minutes um, because everything moves slower when you're in a, in a different environment that you've never been to. Right. So, you know, every minute is every second is a minute. It's communication. So that's communication. Exactly. I love it, man. I've enjoyed this conversation so much. There's undoubtedly a lot of other things that I would love to talk to you about. So certainly would love to have you back on the show in the future. Marco, how can those listening get in touch with you? LinkedIn. LinkedIn is my favorite platform um, created. Um, I like it. There is not, what I appreciate about it is there is no political or religious talk on LinkedIn. Uh, Very seldomly you come across it. Where on my Facebook, you have, uncles and aunts that you don't really talk to and they have very strong opinions about us politics or what's not and Ooh, i don't hey. care for that <laughs> Who, who's this guy with the face mask he looks like a turtle get out of here <laughs> so, yeah. so uh i, I like it because it's uh there, it's a well of knowledge and yeah. there is people from all sorts of different industries whether they're just getting into them or not and uh a lot of meaningful connections like the guys from uh, my car club that I'm a part of are all of them are on LinkedIn. And these are people that have tech companies, mortgage companies, they have all sorts of different walks of life and they share same stuff. That's why we get along. They share a lot of, a lot of uh, beneficial uh, uh, material out there. And yeah, it's, it's a, it's a learning platform. That's the way I look at it. And it's a, it's a great place to make very meaningful connections and to get to really know the people that are active on LinkedIn 
are are great resources to uh, and very approachable people to to talk to. Right, so I that's why I like it. I love it. Um, and then call me <laughs> if you want. Just pick up the phone and, and call me. My phone number has been printed on so many business cards that it's like anybody can call me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I've given I've given up on that side of privacy. So, Amazing. Well, that's it, yeah, man, definitely appreciate your time and joining me on the Dealer Playbook Podcast. Likewise, man. Thank you for having me. Michael Cirillo, and you've been listening to the Dealer Playbook Podcast. If you haven't yet, please click the subscribe button wherever you're listening right now. Leave a rating or review and share it with a colleague. If you're ready to make big changes in your life and career and want to connect with positive, nurturing automotive professionals, join my exclusive DPB Pro community on Facebook. That's where we share information, ideas, and content that isn't shared anywhere else. I can't wait to meet you there. Thanks for listening.